Well, I'm, I'm the last speaker today, so thank you first for, for staying uh, late into the day. Uh, and also, as someone that organizes conferences, um, I oftentimes spend a lot of time thanking sponsors and everyone else, but oftentimes I'm the one person that doesn't get thanked. So let me break that by saying, can, can we thank Caroline for all the work that she has done uh, for this amazing day? I, I can't uh, imagine trying to do a single conference in so many languages at the same time. So that's uh, incredibly impressive and ambitious. And, uh, and I feel that she's, she's done a great, great job in pulling that off. OK. So um, right. Oh, we're, we're, we're <laughs> is there any way of skipping to the front of my presentation? You're at the end of my presentation. And I don't want to have to go through the entire thing going like this, because it'll kind of. Yes. Right. Modifier two clicks. That's okay. You, you'll, okay, great. Okay, fantastic. Okay. So um, right. So um, so I'm as as Caroline mentioned. I'm American. I was originally born, and I'm supposed to stand. Oh, there's the X is gone. Oh, it, there was an X here before that I was supposed to stand on. But um, and um, I uh, moved to the UK in uh, 1997. Uh, this is Oxford, England. This was my first stop uh, in my uh, English adventure, uh, where I uh, came. I was recruited by a company called Blackwell's, which is the uh, oldest bookseller in the UK, to set up their internet bookshop. I was working for IBM before that, so this was this, I guess, was my qualification to be hired uh, into uh, into England. And um, after a couple years there, um, I went on and eventually ended up at O2, uh, which is currently owned by Telefonica. And um, I was there for a couple years. Um, and I was about to take a job, actually, with France Telecom, with, with Orange, uh, in the UK. And my best friend at uh, O2 uh, was a, f a person from Newcastle, a Geordie, as we call them, in the UK. And he convinced me to look at a job in a place called Newcastle upon Tyne, up there in the northeast corner of England. Uh, I thought this was a ridiculous idea, and I paid no attention to it whatsoever. Um, but he was persistent. And after hearing him, hearing him out, hearing out the recruiter, I actually then took the job. And in October of 2002, something drew me to this part of the world. This is a, our famous uh, piece of public art called the Angel of the North. And um, I began um, my trip there, uh, my adventure there. Um, so I was hired to set up a company uh, called CodeWorks. And uh, our job was basically to promote and support the digital and creative industries of the Northeast of England. Uh, the Northeast didn't have, have much of a rep reputation in this field, and so they really wanted to try and, and help compensate for that. In the early days, uh, things went really well. Uh, we were successful in, in leading a, uh, a big research funding bid uh, for, uh, within Europe, uh, and another one in the UK. We started helping companies raise venture capital. Uh, we started a networking organization that we quickly grew to about 150 paying members. Uh, and so things were good. Uh, until about 2005, when the political environment around us changed quite dramatically. Um, so we, uh, the primary contract that sort of uh, underpinned all our activities was, with, was an organization called One Northeast. They were a regional development or, uh, agency. And uh, the entire management from the, from, the, from the chairperson down to all the board directors to all the executive directors, everyone changed. And of course, the new management had new ideas. And they were not as excited about all this digital, whizzy technology stuff. And they thought, well, maybe we should be investing in other more solid, more reliable, more traditional industries like uh, I don't know, uh, uh, it was energy and oil and, and chemicals and these sorts of things. And uh, this culminated in a dramatic board meeting where one of the directors came to our board meeting and announced that my company was going to be shut down effective immediately which was, of course, quite a shock. Uh, we were uh, expecting quite a different conversation uh, at the time. Um, now, luckily, we survived this rather brazen, full frontal assault on the future of our company. But an organization, they were an agency of effectively the central government. And an organization like this doesn't take public humiliation well. So uh, they got smart. Uh, this is what they probably should have done in the first place. Instead of trying to kill us right just by marching through the front door and saying, bam, you're dead. They um, decided to go slow death, right? And uh, so what they did was, uh, instead of just saying, we're shutting everything down, they said, OK, well, yeah, we were wrong the first time. What we're going to do is we're going to cut your funding by a million pounds next year. Uh, and then the year after that, we're going to take the rest of it, the other 600,000 pounds that's remaining. So you'll be down to zero. 
And if you want any more money from us, you're going to have to show to us that you're a vital, uh, essential organization by, uh, by growing your private income, which at the time was about 100,000 pounds a year, uh, and quadrupling it to 400,000 pounds a year. And, in, and then, just then, we may consider giving you some more money. So, and in reality, uh, it was very obvious to anyone that this was basically, we were being set up to fail, right? We were being set up to be, that no one thought in, that there would be no chance in hell that we could possibly ever achieve these things, right? Well, on the one point, managing a decline of 1.6 million pounds in contractual income, whilst at the same time trying to grow whatever meager cash income we had by a factor of four. And really, at this point, this should be the point where this story fades to black, uh, the credits roll, and it says, the end. And I get off stage and I say, thank you. This is a valuable cautionary tale for anyone who's ever been in the private sector. If you ever dare walk into the public sector, it will only be bad news. But um, it's interesting. Uh, I, I don't really consider myself a fighter. I don't really consider myself a lover. I consider myself really just a nice guy. And so uh, had you told me this story, I would have said, well, I probably would have just simply quietly left and moved back to New York and said, well, that was an amazing story, amazing adventure. Thank God I've left. But I decided to fight. And I, I don't actually know why particularly, but I did. And um, so I'm going to take a little segue here in the story. Uh, I think most people will recognize this as the original Macintosh. And if you opened up the original Macintosh, you would find inside, inscribed on the inside of the plastic of uh, the original computer, this, a set of signatures, which was the set of signatures of the original team that built the original Macintosh. And not surprisingly, in the top in the center, you would find Steve Jobs' signature. Further down towards the bottom, there would be another name named Jeff Raskin. Now, Jeff was one of the best known and respected uh, user interface designers of his time. Uh, and before he died, he died recently, he uh, left his son a final gift and a final message within that gift. And in, the, in, in, in his lesson, in his message, what he talks about is that in my experience, uh, designers, innovators, product people, they all cry out for removals of, 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 of limitations and restrictions and barriers. If only I could be free of these things, then I could really be innovative and creative and amazing. And, and this Mac thing would just be one of, of dozens of things that we could do. But actually, it was in his experience, it was exactly the opposite. Uh, that why we all cry out for outside of the box thinking. Bizarrely, it's the box itself that creates creativity and innovation. It is those barriers, those restrictions, those things that say you can't do it that are the very things that lead to creative solutions. In fact, inside the box thinking is what Jeff would have recommended to, in fact, he did recommend to Asa and to his fellow designers and innovators out there. So coming back to my box, if you will, to this constriction, to this impending death, that was being visited upon us. I would say, uh, as Jeff Raskin might have pr uh, predicted, this ended up becoming the catalyst for the most creative and, and productive period of my life, uh, bar none. Uh, on a personal level, um, my uh, daughter was, uh, was both conceived and born at this time, so that was the, the and then interestingly, like, while that was obviously a source of energy and, 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 and excitement, it was also yet another restriction placed upon my life that I hadn't planned or predicted. Um, but it, uh, it would turn out to be another valuable one. I also started reading again. So after 10 years of so of never reading books, really, other than just web pages and articles and magazines and, and newspapers and such like, uh, I started reading loads of books. And one of the books uh, had been recommended for many years is a book called Good to Great. And m many of you may have, uh, have heard of it, if not seen it. Uh, I, I won't tell you about the, the full book. There's a lot in it. But basically, the, the message of the book is really simple. It really boils down to three things. It's basically that if you want to go from good to great, You've got to figure out what it is that you are really good at doing. That you, you, what, what skill is the one skill that you've got that really is the thing that stands out? Right? That's your, so what, what are you competent at ultimately? The second thing is, and which is people sort of tend to miss, is what are you, what are you really passionate about? What, what is the thing that really, really gets you charged up? Right? And the third thing is, what is the economic model that leverages those first two things? Now, for the first thing, uh, for us, was actually quite obvious. Uh, it was, it's ironic. We, we became really good at running events. This is CodeWorks now, and we didn't know why. It wasn't something we planned. It was never part of our original business plan. It's something we just took on almost as a kind of hobby, and, and we ended up becoming really good at running these events. The second thing was even easier, which is that we, despite all the challenges and whatnot, we remained very passionate about digital, about the web, about software, about the internet, mobile, so on and so forth. So that area was, was, was pretty up. What we didn't know was, well, what's this economic model? What's this magic formula that's going to solve all our problems? And um, 
I, I happened to read an issue of The Guardian, which at the time I never read The Guardian, so it was just very, it just happened to be there. I picked it up and I read about something called TED, which of course everyone in the room now is very familiar with. Uh, at the time, this is 2005, it wasn't so familiar, and I, I'd never heard about TED at the time, and I'd read about something called TED Global. They had run a pilot in Oxford in 2005, TED Global. They sent a reporter from The Guardian, named, a woman named Carol Cadwallader, who waxed lyrical about this amazing uh, uh, congregation of uh, scientists and industrialists and, and, and nonprofit folks and so on and so forth. And so I checked it out. Uh, I was shocked to find out that you had to apply to get into a conference. I'd never seen a conference where you had to apply to get into it. Uh, the other, of course, the other thing I found out discovered was this is an extraordinarily expensive concert. It was $4,000 $4, at the time, which is, uh, it's now nearly $8,000, uh, but even back then $4,000 was, was, was a hell of a lot of money. So I managed to find, uh, I managed to apply and, and get in on, they did a handful of these not-for-profit charit charitable cause passes that were far cheaper. They're still very expensive, but, but certainly far cheaper than the full price. And I went to TED, and like uh, other folks who have been to TED, it was a kind of transformative experience on so many levels. One of the things for me, and given the problem that I was facing, was that I quickly figured out that this conference was just fabulously profitable, right? I mean, over four days, rough calculation, I figured they had to be clearing something like $10 million in profit, right? I thought, wow. So if I could just do a tiny fraction of this $10 million, then, you know, I've got at least part of the answer with that was facing me here back in the northeast of England. And at the time, they didn't have TEDx events. This is 2006 now. And so we created our own thing called Thinking Digital. And um, you know, it is the long story is how we got to that name. But we, this is the one that stuck. And we stuck with it. And off we went. And uh, the reaction to my idea, I should say, back at home was uh, not entirely positive. Uh, uh, you are crazy. Uh, I don't think we're ready for this. Uh, this is a total waste of money. Uh, but it was the last comment that really proved to be the most inspiring, which was that a lot of people just simply said, it can't be done, right? And I never thought of myself as being particularly entrepreneurial, maybe now in retrospect that I am, because this was obviously the most motivating of all the things that people said, is that it can't be done, which was the one thing that I actually said, I'm going to show you, it can be done. And so off we went, and we were quite cocky at the time. Uh, we had this expression in the company, go big or go home, right? And we were going to bet the company, and we were going to show those people just how it's done, and we, you know, we didn't have much money left, but what we did have, we rolled it into a new website, a new brand, uh, a new blog, you know, everything we can kind of get our hands on, we did, went and did. Uh, like, of course, Ted's famous for getting a wide collection of some of the world's great speakers, and we did our best to go out there and convince the, some of the world's best speakers to recruit them uh, to, uh, to the Northeast. We were lucky that we had a, a brand new uh, concert venue that had opened up recently called the Sage Gateshead that we were able to put our conference into and give it the kind of the appropriate packaging. And so I would love to be able to tell you that uh, with this huge investment that Thinking Digital was a ginormous success from day one. But the reality was is that despite all this money, despite all this, despite this great plan, we were really struggling in our first year. And I remember six weeks prior to the first day of our conference, we had a 400-person main hall venue. Uh, we only had 150 people actually registered, right? Uh, and this was an expensive conference. I mean, we were asking people for about 600 pounds, uh, uh, 600 British pounds to come and attend our thing, which we thought was a great bargain relative to ten. But of course, they didn't quite see it that way. And so we really struggled our first year, and I can't pretend that, uh, it, that, that all this brave talk about good to great in the TED conference really quickly devolved into all about survival and just saving face. Let's not humiliate ourselves that much in public, please. And um, it, was a, it was a really hard time. And there's a, one of my favorite movies, Jerry Maguire, there's a scene from that movie where he says, uh, you know, my life is an up at dawn, pride swallowing siege that I'll never fully tell you about. And this is really what my life was about at this time. And having to beg, borrow, and steal to get people to come to our conference uh, in some way or another. So in the end, we get there. Um, I would call our attendance face saving, uh, as is probably the most polite way of describing it. It was, of course, a massive black hole in terms of resources. We were any moving warm body that was near me was somehow or another pulled into helping me get this conference off the ground. Um, our financial loss was double what we forecast. We were forecasting something like a 30,000 pound loss. It ended up being close to 60, well, actually more than 60,000 pounds. But the important thing was that we survived. I didn't get fired. And so we rolled the dice again for 2009. Right? So, okay, we've learned a lesson. Okay, we realize it's much harder. We're going to amp up the amount of marketing investment we're going to make, and you know, all that sort of stuff. We're going to be really prepared, and we're going to do it this year. 
And so we launch our conference for 2009 in September of 2008, and two weeks later, this happens. Lehman Brothers collapses, and the beginning of the still existing uh, credit crunch starts. Uh, and what happened after that, two weeks after that, was that our two biggest sponsors from the previous year, Microsoft and Cisco, called to say, I'm sorry, but we're not going to be involved in your conference in any way, shape, or form. I'm afraid the Central, uh, Central HQ in Silicon Valley and Redmond, Washington have said, we're just pulling the plug on everything until we figure out what this credit crisis means to us. And so we thought, wow, it's not going to get any worse. But then we thought, you know something? It could get worse. This could actually be worse than last year. And I have to be honest with you, at the time, we really were, the light was going out at this conference. The light was going out on coworks. The light was going out on me personally. Uh, and, and, I, and I know that certain members of my company were definitely looking for jobs at the time. And I completely sympathize. I could understand that why. So we just say, we, 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 uh, as we say in America, we started uh, circling the wagons. Uh, we said, listen, let's just, we'll just, we're going to go quiet until about February. And then we're going to just you know, hope to hell that the economy has improved and that we're going to then you know, unleash all of our remaining marketing budget at that time, and, and hopefully things will, 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 will turn out well. But a funny thing happened before that time happened. In about November, we started to sell tickets in significant volumes. I mean, dozens upon dozens of tickets. We walk in, we go out to lunch, we'd come back, and there would be more tickets. And we had no idea why this was happening. I mean, literally, we had no idea what was going on, because we were doing any marketing, other than kind of the occasional email or whatever it might be. We weren't big on Twitter at the time, so we weren't even tweeting. And um, uh, by the time uh, February rolls around, there's no need to do any marketing. By March, we've sold out the conference. All this fancy marketing that we were going to do, we cancel it all, and we, and we, and we, and we pocket the cash. Uh, our attendance is way up, our revenues are way up, uh, people are really happy, and what looked like certain death in September turned around and became a huge success uh, by March of two uh, by uh, May of 2009. So obviously, the question, how did this happen? So I, I mentioned all the negatives. Some of the positives were that despite the fact the numbers were small, uh, the people who came really liked what they saw. And they, they made that known to us in, in, in our feedback and a survey. The other thing that happens is, again, totally unpredicted. Uh, we, you know, we, I was one of the people that was making fun of a lot of social media in 2008. But a few things really came to our rescue. Um, one was in blogs. So one of the people who did attend our conference in 2008 was a guy named Steve Clayton. He happened to be one of the, uh, the UK's leading tech bloggers at the time. And he wrote a fantastic blog about how much he, he loved the conference, which was great. Sky News uh, also covered our conference uh, uh, in 2008. And the difference was is that, obviously, even three or four years before, once they'd aired their segment about uh, Thinking Digital on TV, that would be it. You know, no one ever, of course, today, they have put those things online. So now you can link to it and share it and, and all sorts of things like that. But the big thing for us was Twitter. Twitter hit us. And uh, completely unexpected. As I said, I was one of the people making fun of people who were tweeting. And, uh, and I'll just really quickly. So uh, in 2008, our top referring website was Google. No surprise. 2009, again, Google. Again, no surprise. But if we look what happens in Twitter, Twitter goes from being this tiny little 3% thing. And in a, in a single year, goes up by a factor of seven, right? And is a joint, and of course, uh, once we started to figure out there was all this tweeting happening, we started looking at the tweets. And of course, people were trading blogs back and forth and trading personal experiences, uh, linking to the video and things like that, and saying, you should come to this thing. You should, that we should really support this conference. It deserves another chance. And, uh, and that really made, and that's just, that momentum just pro propelled us through 2010, 2011. Uh, all sorts of good things continue to happen. And then in 2012, we come full circle. So the very conference that inspired me to produce Thinking Digital, we started to be actively compared to it, which was a really uh, was a very nice surprise. So uh, th this is the next web based in Amsterdam. This is uh, one of the Europe's leading tech blogs talking about the UK's answer to TED. This is Metro newspaper, which is the leading free paper in, in, uh, in the UK. Uh, again, calling us Little TED. Uh, the Guardian, uh, once again, uh, start have started referring to us as the UK's TED. And I should really add at this point that we never directly compare ourselves to TED because we're not trying to be TED. I mean, our TED is in another stratus relative to we are. We're a, a really relatively small conference trying to do relatively 
humble, although analogous things to TED uh, in the northeast of England. And we're really, you know, proud of what we're doing, and we have a huge TED. Uh, and in fact, we, we go out of our way to contribute where we can, so we also produce these conferences in England, obviously TEDx Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield, Newcastle, and Gateshead, uh, because we, you know, we love TED, and, and we want to do what we can to kind of spread the, the good word of, of all things TED. Right. So 2012 took the, uh, the, the, the latest big step. This was my former house. We sold that so that I could buy Thinking Digital. So I'm now the founder, director, and now owner of Thinking Digital. Uh, I'm very happy that in, this f in the first year uh, that we didn't, uh, we, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big disaster. We continued to do uh, relatively well. I'm very happy about it. I don't know what's going to happen beyond here. Every, all this stuff, this entire story has been what I would call emergent. It wasn't planned. Uh, it happened. I guess we did the right things at the right time. So we'll see where, where it goes. And just some really, uh, in conclusion, some really final, some, some final things. So I mentioned, obviously, the point from Jeff Raskin about barriers, restrictions, and constraints. Learn to love them. Learn to embrace them. I certainly am, I, you know, it's funny. I, I, I really feel like, you know, looking back upon in, 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 in my professional history, whenever I've done anything called out-of-the-box thinking, none of those ideas have ever gone anywhere. It's only when we actually try to do something creative within the boundaries we've got that things creative, interesting, useful things happen. Um, for me, I mean, my life was built. So I was, I'm a graduate from Princeton University. I got my MBA from Wharton. I started out my career uh, at, um, at Gray Advertising, working for Procter & Gamble. I went into IBM and uh, uh, Bertelsmann and all sorts of you know, wonderful blue chip things. And my, my life was really set up to do a very safe, stable, corporate thing. And, and I was doing a good job of doing exactly that when I, I had a calling that said, I need to take some risk in my life. And I realized through this experience that I actually need risk in my life to feel fulfilled. Uh, and I think a lot of other people out there, I think uh, my, where I've come from, and I think in a lot of other places, that we overvalue. We, you know, it's all, especially in a corporate life, it's all about de-risking. You know, it's all about maximizing income with as little risk as humanly possible. And uh, I haven't developed this enough yet, but um, what I'd like to think, uh, the lesson that I can pass on to my daughter when she's old enough, is about how to take worthwhile risks. Because I'm not one of these people that says, oh, you should just go take a risk, go take a gamble, go be crazy. I think that's stupid, personally. Um, but I do think that risks are important. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a matter of, there's, there's gotta be some art or science about understanding, intuitively or otherwise, when is it a good time to take a risk? So that'll be my next TED Talk. And with that, I thank you. <laughs>